just when you think things cannot get any worse for George, you realize his horrifying journey has just begun. 900 feet below ground. This is the terrifying true account of George Lenane's trip to Agon Fundu Cave. Thirty-eight-year-old George Lenane is a company director from Bristol, England. He describes himself on social media as many different things, such as engineer, scuba diver, caver, and hot sauce enthusiast. He is also a popular DJ that performed at London venues. George, the son of a naval officer, was brought up in Fareham near Portsmouth, England. He has a girlfriend named Julie, and they have been together for 12 years. He began caving in 2014 when they went on a holiday to Mexico and went scuba diving in a cenote or underwater cave. George has logged over 60 dives and he fell in love with the sport and wanted to be a cave diver and drive caver as well. In recent years, he has accomplished trips in many of Britain's longest and hardest caves and has also become a qualified cave diver, a process requiring many years of intense training. His friends describe him as a hard as nails caver with considerable experience. In the caving community, he is known for his extensive skills and exploration. One of George's caving colleagues says he is very experienced and is known in the caving world for being a reliable guy that doesn't take risks while caving. One of the things that George loves most about caving is camaraderie and the sense of community. He says caving creates kind of a real tight-knit bond between cavers. He has chosen to sign up as a volunteer for the South and Mid Wales Cave Rescue Team. At heart, he is a caver and a diver. This is what he does, and this is what makes him happy. Steve Thomas of the South and Mid Wales Cave Rescue Team denies that exploring caves is a reckless pastime. Caving is widely considered a dangerous hobby, and when asked why exactly he does this, due to the obvious risks involved, he says it's one of the most difficult questions that cavers get asked and he's not sure that he will ever really learn how to answer it. Caving is by no means an adrenaline sport. If you treat it like one, you will not last long. Most people who think of caving first think of claustrophobia and the miserable stuff that is hard to do, but cavers have a reason to do what they do. It is necessary to get through all the unpleasant things in caving to get to the grand prize, which are things you cannot experience on the surface. There are many massive rooms, beautiful passages, and a whole new planet in the depths of a cave. People cave for the same reason people scuba dive or want to go to the moon. Going caving makes you fit and alert, something that is part of human physiology. Agonfanunde is a cave under a hillside in an area surrounding the upper Swansea Valley in South Wales. Agonfandu, which translates as Cave of the Black Spring, is about 902 feet at its deepest point, which is three times the height of Big Ben in the length of at least 31 miles. It is one of Britain's longest caves. This cave system was discovered by the South Wales Caving Club in 1946. This system is famous for its intricate maze-like structure and its impressive mainstream passage. The walls are jet black with deep water. Once inside, it feels like you have entered a secret underground world. The passages and chambers of Agon Fundu weave a tortuous path beneath the east side of the Ta Valley. I also want to mention that this cave is in the Brecon Beacons in Wales. The stream passage cuts through black limestone, producing waterfalls, rapids, deep potholes, and scalloped walls. The entire route is described as classic, during which cavers will see everything from huge chambers, beautiful formations, to chasms and thundering river passages. The first thousand feet are wide and tall, dispelling the myth that caving means something wriggling through tight spaces, and if you venture further, you will pass some breathtaking and wonderful sights. At the heart of the cave lies the streamway, an underground, fast-flowing stream that is sometimes very hard to navigate. The streamway in other parts of the cave are prone to flooding, and in any event, a journey down is long, cold, and wet, so you need to be prepared for that. It can quickly cause your death if you do not know what you are doing. Accidents can and do happen in caves. A boulder can stay in place for 10,000 years, and one day it will move when you least expect it. You can walk across a section and have a collapse at the exact moment you are going across. Cave systems are like time capsules. 
Some areas haven't changed since the time of the Romans. You see parts that look as if they're going away at any minute, but haven't shifted in years. When they do move, they can be violent. If you run into bad luck deep down in a cave, it could be your last adventure. On November 6, 2021, George and his two friends, Mark Berkey, 52, a rope access technician from the Midlands, and Melissa Bell, 34, a charity development manager from Stratford, headed on a trip to the deep cave system, Agonfundu. The trip would take six hours from the time they entered the cave until the time they left. The group had planned to meet up afterward with George's partner, Julie, at the South Wales Caving Club headquarters for a fireworks display. The goal of this trip was to explore the Upper Smithy, a rarely visited part of Agonfundu Day. They made their way into the cave and worked their way down the narrow passages to an opening. The cave was very wet and slippery. It had been raining recently and the water was dripping from the ceiling of the cave. They worked their way down the cave and decided to turn back after a few hours of exploring. They started to make their way back to the surface, but before they were able to, they had to cross the floor of the Upper Smithy. This is the part of the exit of the cave that was most dangerous and the friends were very aware that they needed to pay full attention to not have anything go wrong here. George's friends went first and were able to get across without any issues. Mark looked back at George and told him that he could pass now. George started to step out on what seemed like a solid floor and started to make his way across. He was already halfway across when he started to realize the floor was little more than a collection of rocks wedged together above a chasm. He started to freak out. He realized that he was in a horrible position. He could feel beads of sweat starting to pour down his face. His body was about to go into shock, but he knew he had to make it across. With no warning, the rock floor beneath him suddenly gave way and he plunged into the void below. It was instantaneous. He could hear the noise of the boulders moving, his legs flailing around and his arms trying to grab onto anything, but he was in midair. And then it all went black because as he landed, more rocks fell on top of him and knocked him out. At this point, George was 900 feet below ground. This was a total nightmare and an absolute worst case scenario. George just fell 30 feet below. He slowly regained consciousness as his friend Mark climbed down to help him. George woke up and realized he was injured and could not move. Mark asked George if he knew where he was and what just happened. There was a lot of blood coming from George's face and he had soft tissue damage. His injuries were life-threatening. Lying in the blackness hundreds of feet below Brecken Beacons, George had broken four ribs and dislocated his collarbone. His jaw was shattered. He had lost several teeth and had a hole open in his face from his mouth down to the bottom of his chin. He had a fracture to his right tibia and fibula and had greatly injured his shoulder. He was bleeding a lot. George didn't know it at the time, but he had lacerated his spleen, which if left untreated, he could easily bleed to death. He needed urgent help, yet to get him out of the passageways of the underground maze, he would have to get through an underground river that was very dangerous. He was screaming at the top of his lungs in pain. It was a horrible experience. After assessing George, Mark knew that he needed to get rescuers immediately, so he left the cave by himself while Melissa stayed to keep George company and tried to keep him awake. At this point, George wanted to fight to survive, but he was losing a lot of blood, which made it hard for him to have any energy and to keep his eyes open. The only light that they had was Melissa's headlamp. She was fearful that if she moved, she would dislodge some of the boulders and they might fall down and crush George, perhaps killing him. She felt incredibly helpless in this situation. There wasn't a lot she could do because George was in such bad shape, all they could do was wait for rescuers. She couldn't see George as she was trying to conserve her headlamp batteries, but she could hear that he was definitely in pain. And George was in an incredible amount of pain. But he was tough, which is something his friends knew would help him if the rescue team was actually able to make it down there in time. George wasn't quite sure, however, and he didn't know how long he was going to live at this point. Every single breath was a challenge. It was a tremendous struggle just to stay awake, because he knew that if he closed his eyes, he might not ever open them again. At times, he would just accept that he would probably die in the cave, and then just as quickly, he would snap out of it and start fighting again. The pain was coming in waves. He could feel his teeth were missing and his mouth was filled with blood. 
He knew his leg was broken and that he had a hole in the bottom of his face. It might take an experienced caver only about an hour to get from where the site of the accident happened to the nearest exit. With George in this condition, it would mean a long, flat-out crawl with sharp and awkward bends. Totally impossible for a person strapped down to a stretcher. To survive, he would need rescuers to stabilize him underground, then carry him miles back to daylight the long way by the cave's top entrance, a huge undertaking that will involve many obstacles. Although George was confident that Mark would make it out of the cave as fast as he could, he knew that it would likely be hours before help arrived. George was resting with his head still pointing downhill, his weight pushing down on his collarbone and ribs. He was horrified for the fact that he would have to be moved to be rescued. He knew that he needed to change his position, so he started moving while screaming in pain until he found a place where the floor sloped up and he could put his head above his feet. Melissa had to sit there while listening to George scream and try to position himself upright. This was also very painful. George realized that if he wasn't in the correct position when the rescuers got there, he would throw up lots of blood and he'd be in big trouble. Now that George was in this position, all they could do was continue to wait. The accident happened at 1 p.m. Mark finally emerged from the cave at 2.30 p.m. and rushed to a nearby caving club headquarters. Luckily, part of the building is the command center and the equipment store for the South and Mid Wales Cave Rescue Team. Mark was able to brief the rescue team coordinators at George's location and the rescue operation was given the green light and initiated. It took about two hours for the first responders and rescue teams composed entirely of cave volunteers to make their way through the cave, carrying their bags of first aid gear to reach George. For hours, Melissa asked George about Julie, his girlfriend, about his life and what he likes to do for fun, just trying to keep him awake and alive. George could only give one word answers. At times, he was semi-conscious and he just wanted to be left alone. In those cold, dark hours, he sensed the presence of his late grandmother, Flora Dawson. His mom worked as a nurse, and when she was out on a shift, his grandmother would take care of him. George is not superstitious or a spiritual person, but he believes that, somehow, she was keeping him alive, and her soothing voice was in his head encouraging him to fight. All of a sudden, they could hear voices, and it was the rescuers. The rescuers quickly ran over and checked him out. The next person to arrive was the doctor. All of a sudden, George got a huge shot of adrenaline and realized he had a chance of making it out of this cave alive. So many things had to go right at this point for him to make it out. If the rescuers ran into any major issues, George would die. George was still trapped in the rocks and boulders and the rescue team had to pull him out before they could put him on the stretcher where they could reassess him again. Then the rescuers would have to enter the cave's long underground river tunnel and carry him for more than a mile upstream. After that, they would have to haul him on ropes up a 100-foot vertical shaft and then through a labyrinth of tunnels. After that, there would be another big vertical drop in more passages before they reached a narrow gateway onto the mountainside, the cave's top entrance. The operation was enormous, involving members of eight regional cave rescue teams called in to assist their Welsh colleagues with more than 254 people working underground in a series of six-hour shifts, including 10 doctors. Others were on hand at the clubhouse providing hot meals and support for the rescuers. CaveLink, a new technology that allows text messages to be sent through hundreds of feet of solid rock, was used so that rescuers on the surface always knew how the cave rescue was progressing. They put George on a stretcher, which was one of the things that George was absolutely fearing the most. They splinted his leg and asked him if he would like some morphine. They proceeded to give him some morphine, but the pain was so intense that drugs did not have much effect. At this point, he was getting pretty cold. His temperature was slowly falling and his vital signs started to fall as well. He was in horrible shape. His pulse shot up from 70 to 140 and he felt he couldn't breathe. They started to give him more oxygen and he slowly improved. His body was finally getting what it needed. At last, they had emerged into a cavern known as Big Shacks. There, the rescuers warmed George with electric packs. At about 4.30 a.m. on Sunday, Dr. Brendan Sloan, a caver and intense care consultant, 
at Pinderfield Hospital in Wakefield, administered tramamexic acid, which stopped his internal bleeding. He was also given more potent morphine. That woke him up, and his body came out of shock, which made him more conscious. Now he had some energy to fight and stay alive. While George warmed up, other rescuers were rigging ropes to get the stretcher past the cave's main obstacles. The next major hurdle was the river. They knew this was going to be difficult, and they fitted the stretcher with a waterproof skirt, enabling it to float. Unfortunately, many of the pools in the stream tunnel are at least chest deep. When they got into the deep parts, the stretcher's design met George's feet sank into the water. Water started covering his whole body eventually, and he was worried about his temperature. George still remained in high spirits thanks to that adrenaline rush. Many of his rescuers were actually his friends. Seeing faces that he knew was such an uplifting feeling for him. Every time he saw a friendly face, it gave him another boost. Lashed onto the stretcher, George started to become very uncomfortable. He was totally immobile, which of course is the whole point. They couldn't risk him falling out of the stretcher or his legs slipping out, bashing against a rock. At last, the rescuers got him to the home stretch. The teams that had been in earlier were back on top to help on the final part of the rescue. Everyone who was helping out during the entire rescue was in this tunnel, and George saw many of his friends. George never saw so many people in a cave before. Eventually, he could smell the outside world. One of the rescuers smiled at George while clapping his hands and told him, we've done it. The rescuers brought him through the entrance gate and into a waiting Land Rover. Then he was transferred into an ambulance. The entire rescue effort included over 250 volunteers including some who were involved in the 17-day rescue of boys and their football coach from the flooded caves in Thailand just a few years ago. At the hospital in Cardiff, George had two operations to rebuild his jaw and his leg. His spleen had recovered, and although he had developed a nasty infection from his jaw, strong antibiotics helped it heal. He did have one night in the hospital, didn't have any sleep because he kept remembering the traumatic event that he had in the cave falling through that floor. He was sure that he had PTSD at this point, but it only lasted one night and then went away. George's girlfriend Julie is happy that he made it out alive, but she will never tell him that he can't go caving again. She just wants him to wait until he's ready mentally and physically from the whole ordeal. George has a message for his rescuers in that he is internally grateful for them. Thanks for watching the video and don't forget to subscribe if you like this content. See you at the next one.